Thanks, thanks, Dr. Bueno, and uh, okay. Well, good morning. Um, and this is the title of my talk about the best pathways in bariatric surgery. This is my disclosure and my disclaimer. I am in the active duty, so I, that's mandatory. I put that up there. And I'll go in reverse. Uh, I want to thank uh, Sages and the uh, executive committee and the Sages staff uh, for all the work that they've done um, uh, and the support they've given us. I'd like to thank the rest of the program. And I'd like to thank you guys for showing up on Saturday. Uh, and I say that a little jokingly because when I came in this morning, there was a lot more activity on a Saturday morning than we usually see, so uh, we're pretty thrilled. So thank you all for being here. This is a mandatory uh, military outline. I'm going to focus mostly on the post-operative uh, part uh, and the discharge, a little bit on the, in, on the um, interoperative also, and then finally, really stress the opioid-free aspect of this pathway. <clears throat> Uh, most of you know this, uh, the impetus and the history behind ERAS. Dr. Kellett published a paper in 1997 saying it actually wasn't the surgery that was the problem uh, with um, patients. It was more the, uh, the response to the surgery, in particular the need to control pain, uh, early nutrition, early ambulation, um, avoiding infections, and avoiding a venous uh, thromboembolism event um, to really improve patient outcomes and hospital stays and um, uh, long-term outcomes from surgery. In 2017, Dr. Tellum uh, published the uh, ASMBS care pathway for sleep gastrectomy, and it wasn't really earth-shattering to most of us who practice bariatrics, I'm sure you know that, but it did standardize it so that it, we're all pretty much doing the same thing officially. And they're gonna come out with the one in, uh, for rear wide gastric bypass soon too. <coughs> So I'm going to make it easy for you this morning. Um, some of my talk can be put on this slide, which is the, uh, this is basically a, a review of what's out there in the literature and what really makes the best pathway. But it's not the greatest da data. A lot of single intuition comparative studies, a lot of retrospective reviews, um, and there's a few meta-analyses, but for the most part, there are very few randomized controlled trials that really tells us uh, what's the best pathway, single best pathway? What we know, and that was proven though, is that it does provide patient safety. It does decrease the length of uh, the hospital stay. And there are no increases in the re readmission rate when people use these pathways. It does not decrease cost, however. Uh, it doesn't decrease the length of surgery, and that should not surprise anybody because you guys are pretty fast when you do bariatrics. Um, the complication rates are pretty low. Um, and so they can't really improve upon that. Uh, the most important thing that it doesn't do, it doesn't determine a single best pathway yet. Uh, you'll see from the data that uh, there are a lot of different things that people use out there. <coughs> a little simple slide on the periodic uh, preoperative pathway, which you guys are know, but I wanna put the point, uh, uh, make note of the psychological aspect of it. I was arguing with my one of my psychologists about when the change in behavior or when the, uh, um, uh, when do we try and uh, promote behavior change in these patients? It'd be pre-op, post-op, uh, during their, their surgical, and I, I would submit that we don't really know that one, and I was trying to get some patients, you know, passed on forward because they had bad diabetes or bad hypertension, uh, and he kept saying from a psychological, she's not really ready, and I said, well, that's probably not gonna change, that behavior's not gonna change in four to six months. You know, give her the surgery, let her get better, and let her see some positive outcome from weight loss, uh, and then you can continue to work on your change. Yeah, but the data doesn't really support one way or the other. So it was a healthy, professional conversation, and I still like the guy. <clears throat> so these are the things that uh, uh, we're focusing on in the period. period. Uh, and I put controversies, they're not really controversies, but they're just seen uh, as adjuncts as, of what we can do better. So the, the carbohydrate drink beforehand, uh, the use of endoscopy, neuropathy, and you can read it, uh, <coughs> what's going on um, down there. <coughs> so reduced fasting time uh, doesn't really help, doesn't really work. Um, it, the bottom line is uh, all you'll need to know on this slide, which is not directly studied in patients. Um, this 2014 Cochrane Review, almost 2,000 patients, it does definitely reduce nausea and the length of stay. And for the 
um, diabetic patients, it does decrease, uh, or excuse me, increases sensitivity to, ins to insulin, uh, and it doesn't um, decrease the risk of, uh, or sorry, increase the risk of aspiration. That's always the concern of anesthesia. And I always laugh because when we interviewed the ERASH protocol in our hospital, they're like, yeah, yeah, you can do two hours before. And then I say, well, great, we can deal with all our patients, right? I'm like, oh, no, 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 just the ERAS patients. And I said, what's the difference? And they said, no, no, we still want six hours time, and, but for the ERAS, we'll let you do it. I'm like, all right. Uh, another meta-analysis in 2017, a few more patients, 3,000, uh, showed that the only real benefit was length of stay reduction. <clears throat> um, uh, same thing in, in these trials. Then there was one randomized control trial, as I said before, this came out in 2016, uh, but unfortunately in this control trial, they didn't really show a difference, uh, and certainly not a difference in post-op nausea and vomiting. Um, feeding on the day of surgery, um, that's something I think basically patients just sort of like. Uh, there's no real data that shows that's any better or worse, and the same, there's no real data that says you have to wait a day for that matter. <clears throat> so leak test, this is a, uh, um, uh, but I don't know if you do these or not for your sleeves or not. It's kind of uh, debated and, and tossed around. Uh, there really isn't any benefit to it. Um, I, I kind of like to do it, though. <laughs> if I put this slide up, I still like to do it. I think it gives the residents a chance at some intraoperative endoscopy with a patient in the supine position. But I also can see if there's going to be a twist uh, in my sleeve. So while we all do it for leaks and we say it's a negative leak test when we dictate it, uh, I like to see if there's going to be a potential twist in there. Um, but again, very low sensitivity. You can see zero and 8.7%. And there's really no correlation with that leak test and if they're gonna develop a leak later on. <clears throat> um, the swallow test afterwards. So um, I used to be a big swallow test guy afterwards. Uh, and in this, you can see in this paper for sleeves anyway, uh, Dr. Shivan, over 1,100 patients. Um, the leak rate, uh, about 2.6%, all diagnosed pretty late, like 23 days later. Um, so getting that swallow test on the first day probably isn't going to happen, or, or not going to need, be needed. Uh, and the rear eye gastric bypass uh, data, again, leaks occurred typically on post-op day seven, um, not very often, and um, therefore that post-op day one leak test wasn't really helping you out either. Um, the uh, MBS AQIP data here with 131,000 patients again confirms it. So I don't think you really need to do that swallow test on the day after, only except if you're concerned about it, if you're worried uh, there's a difficult dissection, maybe a revision. Um, it, otherwise, it's not, that's not needed routinely. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, and the routine drainage. So a lot of people used to leave drains. Uh, some people still do. Um, again, no real benefit in uh, identifying the leak uh, because, again, the leaks occurred several days after you've already removed the drain. Uh, maybe you want to keep it in again just if it's a tenuous uh, anastomosis or a very difficult one, but really no benefit in, in, in leaving that JP drain in. Uh, the MBSA QBA data, um, I think, is a little misleading. That was their, um, their uh, conclusions that associated with leaks, reoperation, and readmission, but um, it's same thing again, you, you put the drain in. I don't think the drain's causing those things. I do think it happens. You're more worried about those, so you leave them in, and then uh, you, your suspicions are right, and those patients um, you know, end up having problems. But again, they're left in or put in because people were worried about them in the first place. <clears throat> so this is a summary of the data that we presented in 2014. It's not my data. Don't let me, don't, don't let me try and fool you there. Um, but. Uh, the American chest and then the, the groups on the right column you see, uh, we all kind of met and, just, and, and came up with these. Um, the bottom line is um, it, chemical and mechanical prophylaxis uh, is, is, is recommended by the groups on the right in all patients. And then in the, the American chest, um, they said only in high risk patients uh, with a high risk of, uh, uh, without a high risk of bleeding. Uh, but filters are not recommended, and extended chemoprophylaxis is there's not really recommended or considered only in high risk patients. <clears throat> so when can you, uh, when should you really con be concerned about your uh, VT events? Well, in these states here, and uh, we all know these: the bigger people, um, the more sick people, the revision people, the poor functional status people seem to have a lot of complications, and they uh, have issues with uh, you know mobilization already because they have poor functional status. <clears throat> um, for people who don't give chemoprophylaxis, there's a little bit of, to me, a little bit of a uh, um, taking a, oh, not say risk, but if you know your patient is going to get off a table within a couple hours 
and they're young and they're uh, ambulatory, you probably don't need to have the chemo prophylaxis if you're doing a sleeve, for instance. Uh, you're usually off of, the, off of the table in 45 minutes to an hour, um, and you're going to be up ambulating. You probably don't need it for those patients. Um, uh, these studies that I have here are very short ORB times for the uh, for bypasses, which tend to be a little bit longer, uh, but still within two hours they d they don't really have any complications with VTEs that are any higher, even if you use the chemo prophylaxis. So, uh, if again if you're doing pretty well, uh, short operative period of times you probably don't need it. As far as ulcer prophylaxis is concerned, um, I think these are pretty good studies, uh, a little bit better because they were some direct comparisons using the PPI, and the bottom line is you should probably use it, and you should probably use it for about three months afterwards. Um, certainly a decreased risk in the ulcer formation to begin with, and uh, a decrease in the length of, and the length of, with the use of longer time on the, on the PPI of uh, ulcer occurring. <coughs> so moving on to the pain control aspect of it. Um, in, in these studies, uh, and I don't put much data up here because there really haven't been a whole lot of data on it, certainly not in bariatric specific, uh, but the uh, IV time I was associated with early discharge, um, uh, more preoperative costs around time of the operation, but less ED visits, um, and then a uh, little bit less narcotic use. So I think that's a pretty good thing to ex express, or, I mean, uh, stress, uh, because our narcotic use I think is pretty dangerous for our patients or any patients. <laughs> Uh, so using uh, bupivacaine, uh, again, uh, not really uh, great data, uh, but it does reduce opioid use. Uh, so you're replacing um, uh, one medication for another, and I'll talk a little about the cost later on. Uh, but if you can reduce those opioids, I think that's a pretty good thing. <coughs> so gabapentin, again, uh, some data in the uh, perioperative period, uh, but no really over overall effect except that less opioids. Um, so it's kind of funny when you go through all their pathways, every, nobody has the same uh, perioperative pain medication pathway. So I can't tell you which combination is the best, but if they reduce opioids, I'm, I'm pretty much in favor of it. <coughs> Sorry. There we go. Um, so this is on the SAGES website, their smart pathway, and, and so, um, you know, even they uh, have some. Um, things that uh, people use uh, regularly. Um, you see decadron use there and toradol use. Uh, and in their post-op pathway, they have a PCA morphine. So this is right from the web, uh, website. Um, <coughs> so in summary, uh, using with, I've been focusing mostly on sleeves and bypass, I understand. Um, the use of a carbohydrate drink is you know, a little controversial. Maybe you need it, maybe you don't. Uh, intraoperative endoscopy, you probably don't need it for the sleeve, um, and, and you can read the rest of the recommendations there. A rec a summation of what I say, of what I said this morning. Um, <coughs> so, and then this is another way of saying it: Is there? It does ERAS do what we thought it was meant to do? Does it decrease length of stay? And the answer is yes. Is there a decrease in morbidity? No. Is there a standard protocol? No. Uh, but it may decrease the opioids. Sorry. All right, and there's some fun, some key lessons. The compliance is key. Uh, you got to educate your staff, and you can't expect all of your patients to get there. So if you have a BMI of 50, uh, and you have a long operative time for whatever reason, or their patients are kind of sick to begin with, right? If they're bad OSAers or very different brittle diabetics, they're probably not going to get out of it within a day. <coughs> All right, um, these are some uh, ideas we have for reducing opioids. I'm just going to kind of run through these a little quicker because uh, I'm running out of time. Uh, this is our experience uh, at uh, uh, Tripler, where I work. We, we've officially started in 2018 trying to get off the opioids altogether. Uh, and I'm going to get to the later on slide here, sorry. Um, so this is our, our data and our bypass. Only about 25% made it out in one day, uh, and only and, but 75% in the sleeve made it out one day, which is probably pretty typical. But some of the, I think some of the reasons the bypasses didn't make it out were because of just people weren't really quite used to what we were doing. Um, so this is the cost slide, and you can see expert up there at 285. That's probably the big difference in between the cost and pre and post op. So if you can get that effect without using expert, you're probably going to be about the same pure medicine cost wise. 
Now, this next slide is what we do in the military. So every day in the military, every nurse, every IV, every uh, uh, bandage or whatever costs about $11,000 a day. Um, the average cost for our patients in, uh, for 2017 was 25000 uh, So we think we're saving the Army a little bit if we get them out a little bit sooner. Uh, I don't really know that. And again, this is a military hospital, and there's all kinds of different ways to estimate payment. All right. Uh, I will give a shout out to a couple of my friends, uh, Dr. Onfeld and Dr. Sohn. So they are trying to standardize the pathway across all of the DOD, not just the uh, bariatrics, but also the pain pathway afterwards. And the Madigan Group just down south from here from us uh, has done some good stuff with elective surgery and having no opioid use afterwards. So uh, with that, I'll end my talk. If I can get the uh, clicker to work. and I'll leave you with this slide. Thank you.